Here's somebody that can actually sit down and yak with us. Oh, this is excellent. Mr. Joe. The clan bottom is here. Have have a seat. <laughs> so, Mr. Joe, how are you? I'm better than I deserve. Well, uh, thanks for uh, stopping by and chatting with us here at Granite Rock for a little bit. What brings you here to the uh, Seacoast Republican Women's and Rockingham County Republican Committee brunch? Uh, I I was invited by Diane Bitter and harassed by Ted Cruz and, and his people. And, harassed? Uh, not harassed. Harassed? It's a joke. It's a joke. Pleasurably harassed, if, that is, if that's appropriate. Okay. So uh, are you expecting anything in particular? Um, I don't really have any expectations. I've only seen Ted Cruz once, so I have to see him at least one more time before you know, I can... Start to make some reasonable s- feedback. Start to make an opinion. Yeah, start to start to make form an opinion. You know, yeah. he's the only guy in the field right now, so. Right, and we were actually talking about some of that, and we were ticking off uh, on our uh, fingers, and didn't need all of them. The uh, the Democrat bench, and uh, actually, I was I was leading up to uh, a little witticism by uh, by X John, one of the uh, tweet uh, posters, that um, you know. Elizabeth Warren is not going to run for Harry Reid's position as minority leader because she's, boom, boom, only one thirty-second minority. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of yesterday's witticisms. Nice. Yeah, I was happy to see that in the in the Judge report that Harry Reid's. Uh, Harry Reid. Re- Harry Reid's retired. He and he and his uh, his eye bandage. Poor guy. Actually, you don't wish accidents like that on anybody. Uh, are actually going to retire and spend some time with the family. And now, if the uh, fossil of the house would also retire, uh, there'd be no nationally known uh, Democrat names anywhere. I'm referring, of course, to Skeletor Pelosi. Well, <laughs> the rumor is is that um, Reid has formally anointed Schumer. Senator Schumer out of New York to be his succeeder. Yeah. I'm quite sure that Dick Durbin out of Illinois is not too happy with that idea either because he was rumored to have wanted that top spot. I, I'm glad that he's comfortable with the idea that there will still be a minority leader and it will be a Democrat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. That's true. But, you know, hope springs eternal and we do know that the pendulum eventually will swing backwards. Uh, the other way, so and and I will tell you, he would not be somebody I would like to see as the uh, majority leader in the in the Senate. But uh, we'll see. So before we get off on this tangent, and this is what we do, because after all, we are the ADD bloggers at Granite Rock. Um, how are you handicapping? Handicapping? Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I'm low on sleep for various reasons today. Yeah. Uh, the presidential campaign, from your standpoint. Um, it's, uh, well, politics here in New Hampshire is, as everybody knows, our state sport. And, uh, it's, it's just starting. It's kind of like an Olympics, if, if you want to think of it like that. And, um, uh, it really just started. So I look at this as kind of the opening ceremonies and, um, it'll be a long process to, uh, hopefully next February, unless we end up moving it up because of other states playing games with their primary yeah. And I, I actually I actually hope we don't. I think February is more than early enough to have yes. primaries. Yeah, it is. Th- there is, of course, going to be a, uh, a time for choosing sooner than that. I don't know if you've been reading the, uh, the news about uh, conservative activities in the state. Uh, a new conservative organization has got together and is, yes. attemp- is attempting to bring in all of the conservative and libertarian leading groups in the state, or as many as are, are willing to, uh, to participate, with the idea that first we get the candidates in as best we can uh, to give them an opportunity to kick the tires, kick the shins, whatever it is they do. And, uh, and then later in, in this year, we will hold a caucus. The idea is to get the activist voters to select a preferred candidate. We can't tell them. We're not going to try and tell them. We need to get them to pledge to support their own choice and then to choose. Because the one thing that always hampers us conservatives is, frankly, we have a very deep bench. We have a lot of conservatives who want to be senator or be president or whatever. 
and the hard part is getting enough votes behind one of them to beat the uh, the moderate. Right, and and the history has been to, um, well, have our opinions dictated from somebody else and be told who, who to vote for, and uh, that seems to be the party apparatus. Yeah, and we're we're tired of that. Whether it's uh, n- whether it's Gnomeville Valley uh, Ski Resort, or whether it's uh, <laughs> or, or, or whether it's the RNC, which is now ninety uh, percent staffed with Bushites. Right. Uh, you know, you know what their leanings are. Uh, say the the battle I'm looking forward to actually is uh, is uh, Kelly Ayotte's conscience when uh, the party dictates to her that she's going to support Jeb Bush and her mentors call in their chits and Lindsey Graham says you're going to support me. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think Lindsey Graham has a has a snowball's chance. Um, uh, but just to back up a little bit. Um, I think it would be it would improve the process if we had runoff elections here in New Hampshire and and um, people could actually make their own choice and then not have to vote for who they think will be the who they think will win or has the best chance to win. And and there is indeed some of that happening. I think mm-hmm. uh, you know in 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 elections when there's a large field, you do see people tend to coalesce behind the one they think has a chance of winning rather than the one they really want to, to push through. Uh, and, and this is why these new organizations, the Conservative Business League in New Hampshire, which is going to work on education and bringing the candidates in, and the 603 Alliance, which is going to work on coalescing the groups and choosing the candidate, and, and again, having the group members choose the candidate. The, the 603 Alliance, um, their event is in Nashua on the 19th of April. That's the kickoff event at which we're going to get as many members as we can of, of a variety of conservative groups. We're going to get some conservative speakers and uh, make it a, a, you know, a bang-up uh, launch. And no, there won't be any presidential candidates speaking. There will be lots of those at the First in the Nation event, which directly precedes it at the same location. Uh, we, we chose the time and place deliberately. But uh, we're not going to invite them to speak on this occasion. We're not attempting to promote one or another candidate or to appear to favor any of them during our, our launch event. And just one question, though. Isn't it more of a case that um, um, yesterday was really the kickoff event, or at least was it a uh, prequel to the first event? Because you guys did have a, an event well, at, uh, at a VFW in Merrimack that was filled to overflowing. And, of course, the left has already started to turn in horrible results, but yet everybody who comes to these things are enthusiastic. Yes, and i got a couple of stories about that. So I, I was actually there. Um, you know, Full disclosure, Skip and I are both involved in these uh, organizations, uh, and uh, we're, we're doing our best to promote them, and we'll be putting up a couple of articles. But uh, the Conservative Business League... Uh, announced its existence uh, just a little before the uh, the Ted Cruz announcement, and the Cruz team said, "Well, can you do an event for us?" and gave us about four days' notice. And uh, indeed, w- you know, the, the Conservative Business League of New Hampshire was able to put together this event. Uh, easily, a couple of hundred people in the room, and uh, a lot of press too. We, I, I think, we counted uh, 26 or 28 news people in the crowd. It's incredible. And uh, not just the press. Near the end, I spotted a familiar figure. Short, round, kind of chubby-faced, short black hair and a black beard and a flip cam. Hi, Jason, I said from behind. <laughs> it was my friend, the tricky tracker troll yes. from the American bridge to the 21st century. How's that bridge rusting, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> was... Uh was he media, did he have media credentials? Did you let him I stay? Don't, I don't know. I, I, since from where he was standing, he may have stu- snuck in the side door. Look, it frankly doesn't matter with some of these. If it's a closed meeting, uh, you know, where uh, some of the some of the question and answers may be, uh, you know, a little probing, you don't really want that kind of person around because they're going to then try and uh, hold off the record commentary as uh, as a firm position. In, in this kind of event where uh, Senator Cruz was giving his, uh, his maiden pitch, more or less, in New Hampshire, uh, 
you know he stands behind every word that he says. Absolutely. And, and if he doesn't, well, he's going to have as much a problem with Republican voters as he is going to have with the trolls. So uh, the only problem with the trolls is they snip it up and uh, use sound bites against him. Oh, I know Peter King isn't a, a big supporter. Peter King of is Cruz. what? Uh, of Cruz? No. Well, yeah. well, Peter King's got his own problems. Uh, aside from being militaristic, which is going to alienate the, uh, the Ron Paul types, um, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with a strong military, but he tends to be more jingoistic than militaristic. Uh, you know, uh, Peter King is frankly a, a disgusting rhino, and uh, he's also in favor of gun control and high expenditures all around. He's not the person you, uh, you would want trying to sh shrink your government. So, you know, it's like, uh, it's like the senator said yesterday. The kind of people that are coming out against him are like an in-kind endorsement, an in-kind contribution. Like, uh, well, what did I see? The Planned Parenthood, their PAC. Oh, yeah. They well, came out against him. It was, it was comical. Yeah. Well, he said the New York Times article was the one that took the cake mm -hmm. uh, because they, uh, they ran this piece saying how the, uh, the Republican establishment was all coming out against him. And he said he felt like Xeroxing the uh, – that's showing my age there – Xeroxing the uh, the article and sending it out to uh, supporters, and uh, he said, "But you have to be careful because that would count as an in-kind contribution from the New York Times." <laughs> in other words, you know, in in this case, uh, with enemies like that, uh, you know, he's uh, he's got plenty of friends. I'm I'm trying to remember where Reagan was at in this stage of the game. He was he was pretty low at the stage in the game. I mean, he was a popular man, a popular actor. Uh, he'd been a governor, of course, which helps no end. And, and that's the one thing that Ted Cruz doesn't have. He's got a good resume, right. but he's not actually been a governor. And, you know, I'm, I'm very interested to see if he can sort of, you know, if he's got enough of a record and a resume to stand on that not, not having been a governor doesn't matter. Yep, and, and I think that's the appeal that Scott Walker will bring to the table if he jumps in and is that, that executive experience. Um, uh, I think so, too, and he's, he's got a long track record of standing firm on positions, uh, of winning elections on, against the worst odds, even uh, winning when there was a, uh, a, an attempt to replace a Supreme Court justice that would have caused a ruling to go against him. Uh, he, uh, he, or his... His team handily de defeated the uh, Democrat minions that were attempting to flip that uh, Supreme Court seat in Wisconsin. So I think, uh, you know, Governor Walker's got a great, uh, a great story to tell. Uh, yeah, he's he's got that uh, that uh, endurance and, and longevity to kind yeah. of persevere through through uh, through all the attacks. Yeah, the other the other one that I like, I like uh, Perry. He doesn't get mentioned a lot by other people. There's a there's a big difference between people like Perry and I suspect when we see him, Jindal, and folks like Bush and even to some extent Walker, mm -hmm. is how they approach the electorate. Bush especially has uh, gone mostly for the high-end, closed doors, donor sessions, you know, hanging out with people like Fungus Cullen, uh, the disgraced former party chair, and, and so on, uh, and you know, not getting with the voters. And uh, Walker's in danger of getting sucked into that orbit, and I hope he sees it in time. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Perry likes to get out and meet the people. Cruz likes to get out and meet the people. I think if we see Jindal up here, he likes to get out and meet the people. There are plenty of them that do, and I think if they're hoping to win New Hampshire, I think it's a defining feature of New Hampshire. You know, if I haven't shaken his hand three times, I don't trust him. Right. It, New Hampshire politics is like no other state. Um, and I, I kind of pride ourselves on that. No, it's, it's, it's why, in spite of the distortion it causes for the in-state Republican politics, we kind of welcome the first-in-the-nation primary thing because uh, with a relatively small and very active political population, uh, New Hampshire's the ideal place to, to vet candidates, and I know Iowa has its unique way of vetting candidates and does an extremely good job, too. Uh, but you know, we, we do have a, a perspective that makes a heck of a difference to how uh, how the candidates are winnowed. I, I just saw our friend Jack Kimball step in the room. Yeah, um, I 
Jack, Jack's showing a lot of interest in, in Ted Cruz. Again, he's not picked anybody yet. I can say that for certain. Right. Uh, but, you know, this is one set of tires or shins. I think a lot of people want to kick uh, very thoroughly. Does he really mean what he says? Does he really stand firm on those principles? Will he change or wilt under pressure? So far, the indications are not. Uh, even better than some of the, uh, some of the governor candidates that, uh, that are out here. Uh, so... Um, I think he's got a good story. And, and, and like you said, you know, Reagan at this time, I actually think Cruz is facing slightly different odds than Reagan did. I mean, they did everything they could to prevent Reagan getting the nomination, and then they tried to sabotage him by putting H.W. Bush on his team. And, and nothing to denigrate that fine, honorable gentleman, but he's not conservative like, like Reagan is. No. Um, but uh, I think he's, the parallel is closer to Barry Goldwater. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that comparison in yeah, a lot yeah, of the... not, not, And again, not because I think Barry Goldwater's a bad guy. I think Barry Goldwater's an excellent guy, or was an excellent guy, a very staunch conservative and, and almost libertarian, a man who stood on his principles, come what may, which is why Reagan was willing to work so hard to try and help him get through. But the, uh, the Rockefeller wing was absolutely incensed and, and totally scared at the thought of a, of a Goldwater presidency, and they actually sabotaged their own man even after he got the, the nomination. You know, it came close to that with Reagan, but once he got the nomination, they at least managed to beat out a compromise, and, and, uh, and he won. So the question is, you know, is Ted Cruz facing Reagan-like odds, or is he facing Goldwater-like odds because of his really firm position and the fact that the media... All of the media is going to try and beat the drum that this guy is too extreme to be near the, uh, the Oval Office. I, I think that uh, one of the advantages that Reagan had after he got the nomination was that he had developed a rapport with the people. And it didn't matter what, what you know, your, your Rockefeller types said about him. Um, he had that, nat that natural rapport. Maybe yeah. it's from being an actor. And I think Ted Cruz has that appeal as well. He's a, he's a brilliant speaker. And, uh, you know, he gives you the warm fuzzy, which is what everybody looks for. Yeah, and he likes to get in and mix it with the people. And he, 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 when I get the video posted yesterday, or if you saw it live, he absolutely mixed with the people. Uh, his entrance to the room was delayed. You know, we're looking around the room, and the room's about two-thirds full, and we're thinking, where, where are the rest of the people? And then he arrived, and then there was a delay, and then the people started coming in. About a third of the people that attended the event waited outside to get a better chance at access to the candidate as he made his way in. And about half of the press was outside, too, with their portable cameras. I mean, they, the press was all over him yesterday. Yeah. It, it, was, uh, it, was quite, it was quite the event. And you know, by the time all the people that had been hanging outside came in, the room was indeed packed end to end. Okay. Well, guys, I think it's time to take a break. Folks, we are Grok Talk, a production of GraniteRock.com, and we are at the Portsmouth Country Club for a Ted Cruz event that will be coming up very soon. We'll be right back. Yeah. 